nesclí quant o sat o a me te quat huilum. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming today here on the land of the Musqueam people. My name is Grace and I'm from Musqueam. I'm very happy to see you all here today and I would like to say welcome. Over to you, Bathsheba. Hi, hi, thank you, Grace. All right, Bathsheba, I'll leave it to you to do introductions. Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to this uh, amazing, amazing uh, symposium. We are so glad that uh, you've all chosen to be part of this wonderful day. Many, many thanks to Grace for welcoming us so warmly, and we do very much appreciate. So we have two terrific speakers for today, and I will introduce both of them. Our first speaker this morning is Brad Baker, and Brad Baker is a member of the Squamish Nation and the District Principal of Indigenous Education for the North Vancouver School District. When he was hired in 1995, Mr. Baker was the first Indigenous educator hired by North Vancouver School District. Several years later, in recognition of his service, he was awarded an Indispire Award for Indigenous Educational Leadership in 2014 outstanding accomplishment after less than a decade of teaching. He is currently completing an educational doctorate at UBC in the Department of Educational Studies, which focuses on decolonizing and indigenous, indigenizing schools, as well as improving educational outcomes for indigenous students within the K-12 school system. I've known uh, Brad, he's, um, he's a committed educator and also someone you don't want to miss listening to. Our second speaker in the afternoon, and please don't leave when we have a break because you will be missing a lot, is Dr. Michelle Stack. Michelle is an associate professor at the University of British Columbia in the Department of Educational Studies. Uh, Michelle's work is rooted in educational equity and disability studies. She's the co-author of a book with Dr. Andre Mazawi, course syllabi in faculties of education, bodies of knowledge, and their discontents. She's also um, looked at uh, international cooperative perspectives when it comes to global ranking and the politics of knowledge. And she's the inaugural winner of the UBC Public Humanities Award. I've worked with Michelle for a long, long time, and I am telling you, you don't want to miss those conversations. So I'll turn it over to you, Shannon. Terrific. Thank you so much, Bathsheba, for introducing our two speakers. I am definitely delighted that we've got such powerhouses joining us today. Um, officially, we're a little bit ahead of schedule, but Brad, if you are ready, you can take an extra eight minutes. What a luxury. Yes, thank you. So good morning, everyone. Hot squall tonight up. OCM NC8, Sonomot, Koshaman, Oxlahan, Okameo, uh, Chickamatoya, uh, Lillawa, and Chickamatoya, Skohomish. So I introduced myself from my Squamish dialect. My ancestral name is Sonomot. I'm very fortunate I get to share that with my late grandfather and my father. And it, uh, the meaning of the word Sonomot is speaker of the family. And so I've been lucky enough to to have that passed down to me uh, through, through many generations. I am on that seat today. I'm on that seat of territory of the Little Watt and, and Skohomish people. I'm up in Whistler right now. And so I'm, I'm grateful to be on this land in the, in the beautiful snow capped mountains. And uh, I want to thank Grace for, for acknowledging and recognizing the Musqueam territory where, uh, where she is situated and where UBC, the campus UBC is. And I think um, Part of what you hear uh, through my through my presentation is the importance of land acknowledgements and how we continue to move forward. And so, around around bringing together and around the 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 notion of hope for us as Canadians to 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 hopefully move towards reconciliation, which which is potentially many generations away. I also want to thank uh, Dr. Letty and, uh, um, and and Dr. Stack for having me here today. I'm very fortunate to, to work with both of them and. Uh, in, in the BN program with uh, Shannon, but also uh, 
Michelle is my uh, supervisor for my doctoral degree, and so I'm very grateful to be here today. So I'm going to take you on a journey today around decolonization, uh, uh, what, how I interpret it and how I view it and how I think all of you uh, as educators or, or just citizens of this country we call Canada can be, can be better and make this country better than it already is. Um, as you heard during uh, the, my introduction, I'm very uh, grateful to be an educator. I've been uh, uh, in the North Vancouver School District for over 25 years. I am starting a new job on December 1st uh, with the Ministry of Education. I'm going to be, I am the new executive director of the Indigenous Education Branch for the, for the ministry. And so I'm looking forward to that position on December 1st and working across the province in all 60 public school districts. And so I'm grateful for that. So I'm just going to share my uh, PowerPoint now, if technology works. If I can just get Shannon or Michelle to say that they can see it is the big thing for me. You can. Yep, we've got it, Brad. Thank you. Perfect. Perfect. Um, and so I think as we as we continue to 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 discuss uh, decolonizing practices, part of my uh, responsibility as a Squamish person, Indigenous person, and as an educator is to share story. And also to to challenge people when, when we when we talk about uh, our practices within the, the education system, but also what we do in society as a whole. So feel free to reach out to me at any time uh, uh, through Twitter or and that's a you know a direct message or, or or tag me in a tweet or whatnot. And also I use the tag "Go Forward with Courage" because all the work that we are doing today, but also within our practices, is courageous work. So I want to thank everyone for taking the time to come today to hear me speak and, and participate uh, in the overall professional development day. I wanna start by sharing this photo. This is a photo from September 30th, the, national, the first National Truth and Reconciliation Day uh, in North Vancouver on Squamish territory. So I was saying um, around this photo that I'm sharing around um, National Truth and Reconciliation Day at St. Paul's Indian Res Residential School Monument, it was a great day because we had Indigenous and non-Indigenous people walking towards the monument from the Salem Tooth Nation. And I think it's important to share because of the, of the, of the, the federal government uh, honoring this day and recognizing this day to move forward as Canadians around, around understanding our true history of our country. And I know part of the discussion we will have today uh, with myself and the Michelle this afternoon is around what do we do? What's our responsibility as Canadians to move forward? And how do we continue to decolonize our practices? And what does that word decolonize really mean? And so this image just kind of, uh, I'm very proud of this image. Uh, it's very close to my parents' house. My father was a residential school survivor. And, and the part of the part of that day was, was acknowledging and recognizing survivors, but also coming together to, to, to share story, to share song, and, and, sh and share the, uh, the beat of the drum, which is very important. In, in my community and my culture. So I'm grateful for that. But through the whole process today, I think it's important to understand that the, the ongoing continuous circle that we have, it's, it's, it's my story I'm gonna share and I'm gonna humbly tell you what I've been on in my journey when it comes to decolonization. And it's very important to understand and to realize all of us have our own story. All of us have our own uh, placement on this journey of decolonization and what it looks like. And it's important to respect each other and respect all of us where we are on this journey. Because if we're able to move away from having judgment around where we are, it's going to be better for all of us as Canadians, which is important. It's important for us to move forward in, in a good way when we talk about uh, decolonization and truth and reconciliation. And this is a quote from Wab Canoe, which is, which is very uh, prevalent and relevant to me as an individual, because the words of Wab uh, of of that educator, Wab Kanu, and the current politician, Wab Kanu, lives with me every day as part of uh, my journey around truth and recon reconciliation. So I share this image. And this is the image of the longhouse of the Chekhamish Center in the North Vancouver School District Outdoor School, which is a hands-on learning experience for, for children in my school district, which I'm very proud of. But as we continue to, to move forward around decolonization and, and the importance of land acknowledgements, we heard Grace acknowledge the land uh, the place where she is today, I, I acknowledge and recognize where I am today in the Lillawat and, and Skohomish peoples up in Whistler. But it's also, we have to remember, part of the process of land acknowledgements for all of us 
it's the first step and it's an easy step around honoring the original occupants of, of Canada and the place where we live. And I think it's important for wherever you are situated, where you're located, where you're going to be teaching, uh, where you're going to live, is to know the land where you are. Know the First Nations where you know the the, the original habits of the land, the First Nations of where you are, and part of that will help us understand and ground us to become more uh, uh, probably in, in tune with the land and how we continue to move forward. And and we look at land acknowledgments, what started for the first time probably about six or seven years ago in the city of Vancouver with Mayor Gregor Robertson. School districts started to are, are currently doing land acknowledgments on, on a regular basis for uh, school assemblies. Some teachers are doing it in classrooms. I think part of it is we, we continue to strive to make them even more meaningful and personal to you as the individual to stay in them. Because originally when they started, we all know, we've all witnessed it, uh, where people are reading from a piece of paper and a script. And so part of the land acknowledgement is to is to move past that script in the in the reading of a, a simple term, but make it meaningful to yourself and to your family and to the place where you live. So that's important about the land acknowledgements. Where you're where you're situated at your home or at, a, at school is acknowledge the territory and land that you live and work on. Because I think, uh, can you hear me still? Because I just said the internet's unstable. Yeah, we can hear you just fine, Brad. Okay, thank you. So it's important as you move forward around the land acknowledgement is to do it at work, but also do it at home and where you're going to educate your, your extended family, your loved ones, your partners, your spouses, because that's part of the obligation we have is to know the territory and land. That we Before, as, as we move forward uh, through my presentation, I want to acknowledge two of my mentors. And on the left uh, is Uncle Louis Miranda, who is one of our last fluent... Uh, language speakers of the Skohomish language and the late Chief Joe Mathias on the right. And I think it's important that these two individuals uh, were able to support me, but also provide the framework and, and the knowledge for me to, to, to lead in a good way, but also to learn in a good way. Because part of uh, the work when we talk about decolonization, it's tough work and it's going to be uh, emotional work, but also part of it is, is, going through the good, the bad, and the differences around decolonization. And these two individuals were strong-minded, uh, have great hearts, open minds. And so I, I try to guide myself after these two individuals who are my mentors from when I was a very young kid to the day they passed away. So then you look at uh, what is your responsibility when we talk about decolonization, Indigenous knowledge. And so this pyramid I use in, in different various different aspects uh, when we're talking about Indigenous education and for today around decolonization. So you, you look at the base uh, of the, this period around Canadian society, what should we know and what, what should we know and what should we do? And that's probably the most important part for us right now when we talk about decolonization is understanding our, our, our unconscious biases and, and our, our, our ignorance and what's, what could lead to racism and how that's part of our fabric in this country we call Canada. So how do we, how do we move away from that? And then the second part of the pyramid is what is your role? What is my role in understanding this? Because part of us, uh, when we talk about decolonization, it's not just for Indigenous people. It's for every Canadian citizen. And that's part of, of, of you understanding your role in this process of, of decolonization. And how do I change? And that's part of what you're doing today on this on this professional development day. You're, you're, you're continuing to gain knowledge to move better and become better around truth and reconciliation, and hopefully decolonize your practice. So this this the this the the, the million dollar question, what does decolonization decolonize it mean to you? So we're gonna we're gonna go into this a little bit. We have to understand it's a process. Um, all of us on this call, including myself, we're on an ongoing journey of decolonization. It, it's not going to happen overnight because when we talk about decolonization, it's not only at the workplace, it, uh, it is within my family, it's with my extended friend group, it's with uh, my soccer team, you name it. It's all part of everyone's journey. And, and we have to understand the process for each individual, each, each, in each group can be different. But the ultimate uh, end goal is to continue the dialogue in a good way, in a positive way, where it's part of the of, of everyday fabric where we're talking about. 
So you look at these, these major points around decolonization. You heard me say it's critical for everyone. It's for every Canadian, not just Indigenous people. But part of decolonization, what you see uh, in the news today and, and also throughout the Indigenous communities, is around self-determination. Uh, it's interesting. I did a I did a conversation on treaty uh, the BC treaty process last night uh, with uh, with the law firm, um, and it's very interesting to hear their perspective around self determination and what that means. But ultimately, self determination through decolonization means the indigenous voice is part of the discussion. Indigenous voices are part of the decision making table, and that's part of the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People, which we all have to understand. Then the third point is privilege. And decolonization will challenge privilege, challenge the privilege of myself as an Indigenous person, but also of non-Indigenous people around the different aspects of life. Because we know for so long around uh, the various policies of oppression the government of Canada imposed or forced upon Indigenous people, they automatically started behind other people when it talked about different rights in this country we call Canada. So that's where we got to challenge our privilege. And then we talk about Sharon's story. All of us on this call have our own story, and that's important that we share our stories. At the same time, we do not try to misrepresent or tell someone else's story in a negative way, because ultimately when we talk about respect uh, and, and, and collaboration and consultation, it's about sharing story in a good way and supporting each other as we go through this process. And ultimately, decolonization is trusting each other. And we have a long way to go to trust uh, with what's going on in our country, with, with the various levels of, of government, organizations, uh, it's educational institutions. So how do we repair those relationships where it's a trust and relationship? And that's the ultimate goal when we talk about decolonization. Then ultimately, uh, when we talk about settlers, and settler is a very difficult term for many people, but ultimately, when I use the term settler, it's, it's anyone that is not an original inhabitant of this terror, of this land we call Canada. And so if you're, uh, uh, your descendants are not First Nations from this, from this land, you, in my mind, you're considered a settler. And so part of, part of the resettler responsibility, if you look at these four main points around decolonization, is to be vulnerable. And I think one thing that UBC uh, uh, is doing a great job of is bringing the Indigenous voices to the table and allowing non-Indigenous people to to understand what they don't know, but also what they do need to know to continue to move forward. Because we have to move away, uh, you know, vulnerability is awesome, but we have to move away from people claiming that they're ignorant towards what our country is all about. Because if we stay in that ignorance piece uh, for too long, what we're gonna move into is racism. And so we gotta try to avoid that at all costs. And then the last two points around knowing our history, I shared the photo of, uh, of the National Truth and Reconciliation Day walk to St. Paul's Monument. And we have to understand that every one of us on this call is impacted by the residential school system. And how do we understand that? And then all then, and then the last point is identity. Um, the government of Canada for 160 years has tried to eliminate or, uh, or assimilate the identity of Indigenous people and it's damaged us. Uh, I say to, to my family and to, to other people in the North Vancouver School District, the government was 95%, 95% successful in ridding me of my indigenous identity. I don't know my language. I know my language. I very, know very little of my language. I practice very little of my cultural beliefs. So my, my goal and other indigenous people's goal is to continue to learn where uh, it becomes more and more our identity is where I'm proud of who I am, but also other people are proud of who I am. And then the discomfort piece, you, you, you've heard me explain decolonization as part of being, uh, is gonna be, it's gonna be uncomfortable. And so if you look at the, the emotionality around uh, decolonization, you will feel guilt, you will feel denial, you will feel denial and shame, but that's part of, uh, of, us, of us growing together and understanding that uh, our history is difficult together. Indigenous and, and, and non-Indigenous people have a difficult history, but how do we come together through discomfort to become better than we already are. And that's where we talk about the importance of, of in the infusion of, of the holistic, holistic approach, indigenous views, worldview, indigenous ways of knowing, and indigenous pedagogy throughout our practices, and even more important in the, in the academia world with that. So with all that information I'm sharing with you, how do we have these conversations? How do we 
hold space to have difficult conversations personally and professionally. And this is probably the most uh, uh, juggling act, if you want to say that, because many times in your personal life and your professional life, you're going to have some awkward and tough conversations with people who are very close to you around the language or uh, the terms they use around Indigenous people. So that's that's part of our responsibilities. You know, you got to ask yourself the question, how do you have these conversations? Because if we don't have these conversations, we're not really going to move forward as a society. So it's very important. So at this point, with the information that I've shared with you, uh, we're going to go into breakout rooms with, with this question. And how do you unlearn what you have, may have been taught about Indigenous peoples and land? Because all of us, if we went to school in the Western education system, we weren't really taught about the true history of this country. But not only that, we weren't taught about the local Indigenous peoples uh, where our school resided. And so we're going to go into this breakout room for about eight or ten minutes. Uh, and I want uh, you're going to be by yourself. There's going to be no moderator or volunteer. So part of what I want you to do is is to have a, an open discussion of uh, how are you going to unlearn what you've been what you've been taught. Thank you for that. And uh, I think you know what I've heard from 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 the, the people that are speaking is the importance of the the listening skills is just as important as the as the speaking skills when we talk about the difficult and being uncomfortable when we talk about uh, decolonization. I think the the part of, you know, we, we hear many Indigenous people speak about, you know, open heart, open mind. And part of that needs to happen when we talk about decolonization um, because of, you know, as the last uh, uh, speaker spoke about this country being so, so, so big. Um, but I think part of it is, um, is how do we how do we work together to decolonize our all of our practices and policies, et cetera? And so, um, so when we talk about that, you know, it's a perfect segue when we talk about uh, about land, right? And so, if you look at uh, decolonization, when we when we use the, when we talk about the land base, and as we know, um, just uh, and as we know, uh, there are many different. Uh, uh, terms, uh, for a terminology when we talk about Indigenous land. And these four terms are very important when we talk about decolonization. And because they're so, they're, they're, they're four completely different uh, uh, words and terminology. And the first one is traditional. I mean, you hear in many um, uh, land acknowledgements, we talk about the traditional territory. I think one thing all of us have to understand, traditional territory to, to my nation, the Squamish nation, uh, is the land that uh, my ancestors uh, used to live off, and that's from, uh, and that's the the watersheds within the Howe Sound area, all the way up here to Whistler, uh, to Princess Louisa Inlet on the Sunshine Coast, up Indian Arm, and to the Fraser River. And many traditional uh, territories uh, overlap with other First Nations when we talk about that. But a part of part of understanding traditional is that the land was used thoroughly used by the First Nations, the original inhabitants. And then we talk about the word ancestral, and in and, and my belief, in, in my nation, ancestral means it's passed down from generation to generation, family, fam, within a family. And so it's important to understand. So if you look at what the ancestral territory of my family, we we originated in the, in the village called Stopness, which is in Squamish, and then uh, our family extended and branched out to the Oslohan Reserve, Oslohan community on the North Shore. So it's, it's important to understand that those two terms are completely different, but also they're important when we talk about decolonization. And then the last year around unseated and seated is very important because um, if you look at the country of Canada, uh, much of the land uh, in British Columbia was stolen uh, from, from the First Nations. Uh, people were displaced. Uh, there was no negotiations. The land was just taken. So that's why it's unseated to understand. We need to understand that part of uh, when we're talking about land acknowledgements to decolonization, we are talking about the land and what's going to what's going to occur with the land in the future. And obviously, see, it means it was named through negotiations. But there was an interesting question I had last night uh, with with the with the law firm that I was working with on decolonization. Many of them were worried about uh, what the word unseated meant and what it might mean down the road. Could it be uh, their the their land? the home they own be returned to the First Nations. And that's a complex issue. I think when we talk about uh, unseated and we move into the treaty process, my belief is uh, it's land and money that will be returned to the First Nations. 
And what we mean by that is crown land. Uh, and I know the Squamish nation uh, has, has renewed or, or received back many land pieces. You look at the Jericho lands, you look at the Sanok lands, and all of that was through uh, uh, the lease lands. The leases were up, but part of that is, is the land returned to, to the First Nations. So part of decolonization is the land returned to the First Nations. And that's a very complex issue, though. And then you look at uh, what we're doing today, and, and, and one of the speakers spoke about attending events like this to continue to learn. And we have to realize, you know, Nelson Mandela is a great individual. Uh, and this, this one quote is very uh, uh, strong to me as, a, as, a, as an educator, very uh, meaningful to me as a, as a current student at UBC, because education uh, will change the world. And part of, of us growing a stronger understanding of what decolonization is and how we're going to get to that, to that end goal of decolonization, what could be uh, uh, ever an, an ever pathway many generations down the road, but we have to continue to educate ourselves to become better. Then we move into allyship, and you know, I could I could use the term allyship. I can also use the term accomplice, which means uh, that non-Indigenous people are are active uh, partnerships partners with Indigenous people but also advocates around uh, their own learning and supporting others learn around Indigenous knowledge and Indigenous worldview, which is very important in decolonization. But I think there's one thing we have to remember when we talk about allyships or accomplice. We, uh, as an, myself as an Indigenous person, we gift that term, allyship, an ally or an, or an accomplice to a non-Indigenous people. And that's part of what, part of learning around decolonization is we just don't want non-Indigenous people raising their hands, saying they're an ally and an accomplice, and they haven't done the work or being acknowledged or recognized by First Nations people. So that's part of what we have to do around allyship. And part of it is being an ally, we have to be critical of any motivation for allies or accomplices, because part of the work that we want to do as an ally or an accomplice is to walk side by side with Indigenous people. We don't want... To move forward around decolonization, we have to ensure that Indigenous peoples are side by side with non-Indigenous people. No longer can the, the non-Indigenous people be in front of the Indigenous people as we move forward. And that's that's part of the learning process that, that many have spoke about already, the importance of the ongoing learning process for all of us around, around decolonization. And the last one is, is the way we act. And that goes back to that, that comment around the, the personal and the professional conversations we have around uh, Indigenous ways of knowing and Indigenous worldview with people. And we have to act in, in a good way with a good heart as we do that. So with that, you know, we talked about the ally and the accomplice being important, but we also have to, to have uh, individuals know that the Norris chair, and this is a, a from Lee, Lee Miracle's book, Com My Conversations with the Canadians, where it talks about uh, non-Indigenous people giving up the Norris chair, where they're not always sitting at the, the head of the table or at the head of a board, because part of us to move to true decolonization is to have Indigenous people in the Norris chair. And that's a major shift within Canadian society where we want to be, where we want, but we also need Indigenous people in the Norris chair. And that's part of, of, of us understanding that there are multiple perspectives. Um, when we talk about uh, uh, the Norris chair, superiority, the Western uh, influence versus the, the, the Indigenous influence. So how do we ensure that we understand these multiple perspectives, but also use them to our advantage to move, our, move the agenda of decolonization forward? And this is a quote from Colin O'Reilly around... Part of, part of the responsibility for all of us is, is to be humble, you know, move away from the arrogance of superiority. And part of, part of the work we do uh, is, is, is doing it with humility. And humility is, is a key term in Indigenous communities, First Nations communities, because it shows the, uh, I believe humility shows the wealth of a family. When I mean wealth of a family is the family connections and the sharing of knowledge and the sharing of gifts. So that's part of all of us to continue to be humble in the work that we do. 
But also when we talk about humility, we got to talk about ethical leadership. And I think part of ethical leadership towards decolonization is, is we, we've heard about our responsibilities, open heart, open mind, which is our moral purpose. But also when we're in schools, working with children, Indigenous and non-Indigenous children, the work that we do to infuse Indigenous knowledge, to, under, to have uh, students and, and educators understand what decolonization is, is to do it in an ethical way. Because part of what we want to move away from is the savior mentality. And I think if we're able to, to, to go down the pathway of true decolonization, it will be done through ethical leadership and not from the savior mentality, which is a very key, key concept for all of us to understand. So that moves us into, into this quote from, uh, from Marie Batiste's book around decolonization, decolonizing education. Um, because, you know, if you look at the way we live, uh, the way we think, um, we have to make sure that we, we, we honor uh, the, the different perspectives, as I said earlier, but also honor uh, and recognize the, an Indigenous point of view through this process of decolonization, which is very, very key. So we're going to go into our second breakout room here for six or seven minutes. And so, um, and this is the question we want, want you to look at. So you, you heard me talk a lot about decolonization, uh, decolonizing ped pedagogy through different forms. So how are you going to do that in your practice? And how are you going to do that within your, uh, uh, your classroom? Most of you are teachers on this call. Or, or, and how are you going to do that in your classroom around uh, decolonizing your educational uh, pedagogy and practice? And part of that is some of you are already doing that in a great way. And how do you share that knowledge with others? So if I can ask the, the, the moderator to put folks in the breakout room for uh, seven minutes to discuss this question, that'd be awesome. And uh, the emotionality behind it is, 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 is important to understand. And I appreciate your group talking about uh, uh, moving away from the checkbox when we're talking about indigenous knowledge or the first people's principles of learning. Because I think it's very important for all of us uh, as educators uh, it just, it's, it's, we're, we're asking you to, to bring, uh, through decolonization, indigenous perspective into your work. And we're not asking you to, to rid yourself of the Western perspective, but we're asking you to include the indigenous perspective as part of your process, because, um, we have to be able to, and willing to, to, to walk in the two worlds of indigenous and non-indigenous, uh, uh, perspectives and share that with our students because a lot of the a lot of the work that we do with students students get it we have to give students more credit for what they know and what they want to know um, we, don't, we can't hesitate to have these uh, uncomfortable conversations with students around decolonization the history of our country uh, etc because um, they probably know a lot of kids probably know more than us because it is part of our fabric of the school system where it, it, it's it's uh you know, as we all know, through the teacher's regulation branch, standard nine is that every teacher certificate holder uh, has to make a commitment to truth and reconciliation and bring the indigenous knowledge into their classrooms. And so that's part of part of our ongoing journey that we have to do. And I think just to just to, to wrap up, um, I want to share a quote from the late uh, Michael Marker, uh, who was my. Uh, who was my supervisor for my doctoral degree, and uh, and, and Michael was uh, very uh, prominent in bringing into uh, UBC, but also into educators across the province, the importance of place. And I think, um, you know, every place that we have here in British Columbia uh, is very important to Indigenous people. So how do we how do we infuse that into our practice? And part of that is for is to is to read this quote, and I like reading it out loud because it's so it's a it's a quote that I that all of us should live by. Educators who wish to take up the indigenous challenge must help their students to conceptually focus a mirror rather than a magnifying glass. So it's a very uh, uh, influential quote from Michael. Uh, unfortunately, he passed away uh, beginning of this year. Uh, suddenly, unexpectedly, but in much of his work, uh, I still uh, take to heart uh, with an open mind also. 
uh, to try to support myself in decolonizing my practice in the North Vancouver School District, and then moving into uh, into my new role with the Ministry of Education. And I started the presentation with my tagline around "Go forward with courage," uh, and and I always want to end my presentations with the term too because uh, what we just talked about for the last hour is 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 going to take courage uh, for all of us uh, to 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 be to move forward, but also to, to challenge the system because part of decolonization is challenging the system because uh, the system was created uh, uh, to, to be a one-way uh, track. And so part of decolonization is to open the doors for multiple possibilities of education. Uh, and we're seeing that in many of our schools today, the different forms uh, of education for Indigenous and non-Indigenous people. And that takes courage to do that. And so uh, as all of you continue forward on your own journey of decolonization, but also your own journey in the education system, continue to go forward with courage because uh, it's, it's, the, it's the kids that, are, that today recognize that, but the work that you're doing today is for the kids that are yet to come into our system. And so if you look at the generational change that I talked about very early on in the presentation, we are on a, we are on a generational change, uh, uh, change of decolonization. And we're very early on this journey. So continue to go forward with courage. And uh, I'm very humbled to, to have the opportunity to speak to all of you today. And uh, I wish all of you the best of luck. So thank you.